on cornerofthegalaxy.com. It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box, the show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Josh Gessman, Mr. Kevin Baxter, very glad to be joining you on a Monday night. As we're recording this wonderful podcast, the LA Galaxy have just lost yesterday. Uh, they lost one to nothing to the Portland Timbers 10-man LA Galaxy after Yellow Van Damme is giving his marching orders early in the first half and about the 32nd minute picked up two yellow cards in the span of three minutes, which Galaxy players seem to have a habit of doing it. Ashley Cole uh, comes to mind as well. But uh, first, I want to bring in uh, my wonderful co-host for this, a man who was in the press box with me on Sunday, got to see all this stuff, and is now in the press box getting ready for an LA Kings game. So if you hear any wonderful noise there, uh, Kevin is, uh, of course, at Staples Center. Kevin, uh, thanks for stopping by, buddy. I know you're busy today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. Uh, it, yeah, if you do hear any ambient noise, it's uh, it's the Kings getting ready to play. They've tested the sound system here. Believe me, it works. My ears are bleeding. Um, but I think it's going to be relatively quiet for a little bit. So let's see if we can jam through this podcast before it gets loud again. Yeah, it sounds like a uh, sounds like a good idea. All right, well, we, we always say we never recap the games on this show. If you want to recap, you go listen to Thursday's show, our live show coming up. But, of course, we can't go any further without at least giving our general thoughts. So, Kevin, the floor is yours. The LA Galaxy lose one to nothing to the Portland Timbers, mostly playing with 10 guys. Uh, what were your thoughts? Well, good and bad. I thought uh, the, the team hustled, and I've gotten already getting uh, emails from readers talking about uh, the incredible effort a lot of these guys put in. Rafa Garcia and and, and Sebastian Legit are two people that uh, have been named. Yeah, you know, and they did put in a great effort. And, but this is the uh, this is the LA Galaxy. This is the fine time MLS champions. Um, I don't know that effort is really what the, the organization is aiming for. They're aiming for victories. So on that score. Um, they didn't come through. In fact, they didn't even score. They had only two shots on goal. Um, you know, players talk afterwards about they're still trying to get some uh, chemistry with their teammates. Uh, you know, Giassi's been out. That definitely hurts the offense. But Giassi's been out all winter. So these guys have been working together. So that the chemistry thing really shouldn't be an issue at this point. Um, you know, and there was it, it, another thing that really troubled me after the game, and I know you were there when Kurt Anoffel talked about uh, making a change at goalkeeper, and he said he wanted to engender some competition for that job and that he wanted Brian Rowe to know that it, you know, not, it wasn't necessarily safe that he was going to have competition this year. Um, you know, that's a laudable goal, but that's something you do in the preseason. I, I, I just don't, I don't think I've ever seen a coach in the second game of the year say, we're going to start some guys who, uh, you know, aren't really starters because we want to get some competition. Now, if, if Kurt has another agenda, if, you know, Kurt said he's not going to throw players under the bus publicly. Perhaps there was an issue with Brian Rowe and his performance in the opener that Kurt didn't like, and so he's protecting Brian, and, and so that's understandable. But, but Kurt did spend a lot of time in the press conference afterwards talking about how this is going to grow, this is going to give a step, the guys got minutes. He was really looking hard for that silver lining, what I saw was a team that had five players on the field that had uh, two or fewer uh, MLS uh, games in, in, on their resume. We saw a very young team. I think they ended the game with the average age was about 24, and we saw a change at goalkeeper one game into the season. A lot of that does not look like things are headed in the right direction. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot to take in. Um... You know, I think I think one fan said it the best. Uh, Scott, who is a frequent listener of the show, said he goes, they, they're both exceeding my expectations and making me extremely ang- angry at the same time, right? And it was, and it's about lowered expectations, Kevin, and I think that's really what LA Galaxy fans have sort of been dealing with is what can you expect from these guys? And I said it 
in my story. I said that with the lineup sort of out there, and this is the context I was trying to put it on, but with the lineup that you saw in the second half, granted, down a guy, that the LA Galaxy look more like a an expansion team than they do the five-time MLS Cup champs. Um, and, and that's not to knock anybody. I think the effort was there, Kevin. I enjoyed the effort. I thought that that was, uh, as Larry Morgan, who writes for LAGalaxy.com, sat next to me and, and we had a talk afterwards. He said, you know, that was one of the most entertaining one nothing games he's, he's watched. And it was. And I said at the beginning of the season, this team is going to be exciting. And they put on a show down a man basically for 56 minutes or so. Um, they, they, they did what realistically what they needed to do besides put the ball in the net. I didn't think we were going to get to this point, Kevin, but without Yellow Van Dam, uh, with the Portland Timbers sitting back for most of the, the rest of the game after they scored the goal, uh, the defense that they put in play with uh, you know Bradley Diallo, with Nathan Smith, both first-time MLS debuts, uh, with Rafa Garcia, and with Daniel Starez, that's an all-LA Galaxy two-back line, and they looked fine. The defense on this team is not, in my que- in, in my personal opinion, has not been the problem so far. The offense has been the problem. No, you're absolutely right. Look, at, at, after Yellow went out, and again, Yellow is your captain. He's your best player. That's why one reason why he's the captain. And he goes out in, in the 33rd, 34th minute. You're absolutely right. After that, they had a back line of only one player, Daniel Sturridge, who played more than two MLS games at the position he was playing on the field. That's remarkable. And and Rafa Garcia was, uh, you know, he was awesome. There was that one play on that uh, breakaway near, in the second half where he fell down, caught the player from behind, and prevented a goal. You're right. This was a Portland team that two years ago was the MLS champion. A week ago, scored five goals against uh, Minnesota. It granted an expansion team, but still five goals in the MLS game. And this makeshift team, you know, held them scoreless. After Yellow, Yellow went out, you know, the goal was in the eighth minute, and it was on a mistake. It was on a breakaway. After that, uh, they played fantastic. And so, you know, on one hand, I really don't want to dump on the team because the effort is there. The players are given everything they have. Um, I think the team that's on the field right now is just simply, you know, not good enough, not experienced enough. It's going to get better when um, Ashley Cole comes back and Giassi's artist. There's been some rumblings. They may be ready next week. I actually think that's probably a little bit early. But in any case, they will be back at some point this season, and that's going to make a huge difference. Um so you can't dump on the effort, and you and it's it, in some ways it's hard to blame the players for the results as well. But this was a very good Portland team. This makeshift defense held them to one goal. You're right; they didn't score any. And the Galaxy, by the way, do not have a a goal from the run of play this season, and that's uh, very concerning because they did have. Alessandrini and, and Gio Dos Santos and Jack McBean and some pretty good players on the field. Yeah, well, Jack McBean has been taking a lot of the brunt, at least on Twitter, from what I've been able to gather. Uh, for my mind, the real absence has been now for three halves as Giovanni Dos Santos has not stepped up to sort of lead this team. The LA Galaxy said they were going to build around him. I think that they've done that. They've let him be the man, and the man has not stepped up yet. He left at halftime in the one nothing loss with a, uh, with a uh, leg injury. Uh, and apparently it was tight throughout the beginning of the uh, of that game and, and possibly even going back into training. So uh, it was a gamble it looks like the LA Galaxy made. You give Jack McBean a link-up partner, you give him somebody to play off of, which is what Giovanni Dos Santos is supposed to be, and I think you're going to see something better. That being said, I think the half chances that the Galaxy have had, and that includes Jack McBean, they haven't been taken. All right, they're not creating enough, and that's on McBean, that's on Allison Drini, that's on Legette, that's on all those guys in the midfield and forward, um, and that's something that has to be cleaned up. Uh, Kevin, we, we, we touched on it, and our next topic sort of is, you know, the worst start for the LA Galaxy since 2001. The Galaxy have not gone 0-2 since the, start, uh, since the 2001 season, um, and it's the first time in franchise history that they've lost the first two home games. Um, and started the season 0-2 with two home games. So uh, it, it's not exactly uh, it's not exactly good precedent setting as far as Cardinalfo is concerned. Well, I'm going to continue to try to be extra positive because it's two games into the season. And, you know, in, in 2014, the conversation wasn't quite the same, but the Galaxy did not win its first two games. It was a loss and a draw, and people were wondering if uh, Bruce Arena and the team had lost their mojo and they went on to win the MLS Cup in 2014. So... Uh, you go back to, to 2001, the MLS was a little bit different. Certainly this is a historic moment because the team has never lost two in a row at home at the StubHub Center where, you know, they have probably the best, I, I bet you they have the best home record in MLS since the StubHub Center opened. Um, but having said that, I mean, their schedule, the schedule makers gave them FC Dallas on the first right. weekend of the season. FC right. Dallas, they're the, 
supporter shield winners last year, one of the best teams in the league by yeah, you know, clearly. Then in comes Portland off a five uh, goal effort in the opener. Very good team, a very deep team. Now they had some injuries too, but the injuries were on the back line. So again, the uh, Galaxy defense here performance looks even better. But the schedule makers did not help the Galaxy much. Uh, and then the Galaxy playing with yesterday, we haven't mentioned they were down five players. They were missing three players to injury and two to suspensions. Yep. Um, so, you know, that factors into this too. So, yes, you can look at it and, and it's, as I did, say they're 0 2 at home for the first time ever. But then you got to back up a little bit and say, is this the true Galaxy team? And when they get those guys back, if we agree that the, the young guys have played well and put in a tremendous effort, when they get those guys back, it's going to make a huge difference. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, uh, again, how that is. I mean, I think you have to expect that Yellow Von Dom is not going to be available for Real Salt Lake. I know there are a lot of Galaxy fans who seem to be holding on to some hope that uh, his his yellow cards will be rescinded, or at least one of them will be rescinded, being that uh, being that both both plays were were quote unquote dives from the Portland Timbers. Um, I think the Portland Timbers will be punished, I, and I want to make that clear. I think the Timbers will be punished, Kevin. Uh, I do not expect Yellow Van Dom to have his yellow cards rescinded. However, I think they're going to go no, in, it, in I, that particular route. Well, yeah, let's talk about that for a second. I I don't think they will because uh, the referee is going to be able to say that both those calls were judgment calls. The first one was uh, you know for uh, uh, for protesting uh, with the official, so the the league can't rescind that one. The second one was. Uh, apparently he interfered with a with a good goal scoring opportunity or good offensive opportunity. I forget exactly the the words the referee used, but again that's a judgment call. And, and whether the player dove or not, that's not what the referee was making the judgment on. And uh, in fact, he admitted yesterday the referee admitted that Yellow Von Dobb did not make contact with the player he was marking on either one of those plays. That's so, correct. Yep. You know that that's pretty interesting. Um, but I, I I do have to mention this, and I don't want to start some sort of a, a Trumpian conspiracy thing already, but. Um, so far this season, we know um, the first week of the season, there were only two players throughout MLS who were suspended. Both were Galaxy players. Both were calls that were could have easily gone the other way. Could have I don't think they'd be ignored, but they, they you know I don't think either player Jermaine Jones or Dave Romney really merited suspension. So that happened the first week. The second week, Yellow Von Dom gets run in the 33rd minute. Now, again, a smart referee I think has to be looking at that and saying, look, we're still midway through the first half. Um, uh, you know, it, it, are both of these fouls to the point where this guy's got to be run? And I'm not saying you, you go lenient on anybody. I'm just saying the, doubt, the referee has to understand the point in the game on what's going on. And so, again, I don't want to say anyone has anything out for the Galaxy. Kurt Onofa would never say that, not in a million years. But it does. it's one of those things that kind of makes you go, hmm. Yeah, it does. No, it, it certainly is something we touched on our Thursday show with conspiracy theories. Uh, listen, I, I still think that the league is somehow still angry at the LA Galaxy for having Nigel de Jong, and uh, Yellow Van Dom sort of fits that aggressive guy, and so did Jermaine Jones, and you've seen both of them get suspended in consecutive uh, consecutive games. Again, not the conspiracy guy. I'm just throwing some things out there for you. If you want to put on the tinfoil hat, that's up to you guys. Uh, you can certainly do that. Uh, let's go to some Twitter questions, Kevin, if you don't mind. Uh, tw- Kevin tweeted out some stuff. You guys responded with some questions, so we're going to go. We're going to try to hit a bunch of these. This will be a little shorter show than normal. Kevin's got to get ready for the LA Kings game, so we're going to get you all set up here. Uh, The first question is from Ronnie, and Ronnie says, how much trust do we really have in Anolfo? Um, I imagine that whenever he says we, he means the fans. Um, I'll turn it like this, Kevin. How much trust do the LA Galaxy have in Anolfo, and how much trust do you and I have in Kurt Anolfo? Well, he was their hand-picked guy. I already got a, a message here from someone saying how long before he gets fired. He's not going anywhere. He was their hand-picked guy. They picked him because regardless of what management says, they are pushing the young guys, are pushing the L.A. Galaxy 2 guys, the academy guys. Anofo is the guy that has the experience with all those players. That's why I kind of read into the Clement Diop starting over Brian Rowe. Uh, he's a Kurt guy. They're going to break in some of these young players. And, and so it makes perfect sense when you look at it that way, that Kurt was brought over to make the team younger and to give some experience to some of these young guys, and that's what he's doing. Uh, you know, so far, the record aside, uh, obviously nobody wanted to start out 0-2, right. but I, I would think that management probably is, is fairly happy with what's gone on. You know, they've got to see both goalkeepers. They've got to see a lot of young players. A lot of Galaxy 2 guys have been called up. We talked to Mike Munoz yesterday at halftime, the LA Galaxy 2 coach, about the idea of Galaxy 2 players looking at the, at the first team and saying, hey, many of those guys were here last year. 
Um, I got a chance to be on the first team before this is all over. And Mike Munoz said that's already happening. The players are talking about that. That's what management wants. They want some. They want their investment in the academy and LA Galaxy two to pay off. And Kurt Anoff was going to make that happen, and that's why he's there. So I, I, I you know, I think, and you, you get the impression too from listening to him at the press conference. You know, he has taken the high road uh, and found the silver lining on the uh, very dark cloud. Um, and that's what he's supposed to do. I think he's totally safe. Yeah, I agree with you. Right now, as far as the LA Galaxy front office is concerned, Cardinalfo is, is there. I, I do question his start with Baggio Husidic instead of moving Sebastian Legette to the center midfield. I think that's one of his first mistakes that he's made. Uh, and he should have brought Emma Boateng in as a starter as well whenever you had sort of that shift in things. You could have easily moved Legette and kept Boateng on there, and there could have been speed for speed there when you knew that Portland was going to be a quick team, Kevin, and you saw it in the counterattack goal. Baggio Husidic has no wheels, started the play from behind, couldn't catch up. If it's Emma Boateng, if it's Sebastian Legette, maybe, maybe they get there on that counterattack and that goal doesn't happen. So um, that was, I think, his first mistake. I actually like Diop in goal. I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a, it's at least a little bit of a question mark, Kevin, in terms of why it happened. Um, I've always liked Diop. The big deal with him is that he's very risky, and I think you saw that in a game that he was allowed to be very risky. Uh, there was no worry really about going down another goal. The goal, the the, the chief uh, point of this was to keep the Galaxy close and let them go forward. And you even saw Diop in the box there near the end, almost connecting on a on a bicycle kick. So I like Diop. If if Kurt wants to go with him, he's going to live and die with him. That's fine with me. Um, I still think I'm a, a big fan of Brian Rowe, but you have to wonder now what happens sort of with the confidence from Brian Rowe, and, and that's a big question as well. But Kurt has made some decisions already. I think he got the, the starting lineup wrong, um, but this is a guy who's going to stick around for a little bit, um, and I think he's going to be there, and I certainly, you know, it's a question mark, Kevin. You and I were kicking it around, and I think fans have been asking it too. Does Zlatan Ibrahimovic want to come play for Kurt Anolfo? That's a good question. That's a great question, and there were some rumors that some of his, um, some of his handlers, some of his uh, the people on his personal team, were there uh, checking out the game yesterday. I, I don't know if that's true, and it, it actually sounds a little bit early in the process. You know, he's still got to play for Manchester United to the end of May, so I think that might be a little bit early for them to start kicking the tires on the Galaxy. But if they were there, um, I don't think they probably came away uh, thinking Zlatan would fit in uh, to that team. I mean, you know, when you're looking down the field. And, and, and I'm not even talking about the style of play in MLS or the game or anything. When you just look at the people that he would be surrounded with if he were in the game yesterday, granted, no Ashley Cole, no Jermaine Jones, you know, a lot of guys missing, but that's what they were, that's what they were looking at. They were looking at Jack McBean and Nathan Smith. Uh, when they looked down and saw that, they probably thought, you know what, our guy doesn't really fit in too well with this team. So, uh, you know, if, if the lockdowns people are watching closely yesterday, it was probably not a good day for them. Yeah, it probably wasn't a good day. And, and, you know, the other question is, is would he even come to a team that is buried at the bottom of the table uh, come July? So I think results will matter this first half of the season. Maybe not for the total outcome of Major League Soccer, but if the LA Galaxy are serious about landing Zlatan Ibrahimovic, then that is going to be an important part of that. All right, we're going on to the next question from Peter Tam. Peter says, will McBean's ineffective play land him on the bench? And will Kurt Anolfo turn to Villarreal and Lassiter? Kevin, uh, you want to kick that one off, or you want me to hit that one first? Uh, you go ahead. I think we're probably on the same of the same mind on this, but go ahead. Okay, I think that uh, Jack McBean's ineffective play so far has been almost 100% related to the fact that Giovanni Dos Santos has been missing. You go to RSL now, you're already going to probably be down Giovanni Dos Santos, and then, Kevin, I think you have an injury update. Why don't you give that injury update on Giovanni Dos Santos real quick? Yeah, Gio was day-to-day with, that, with apparently a hamstring problem. not sure if it's just a if it's a pool or a strain or just soreness. But as you said, he's been dealing with it uh, a couple of weeks. He did it in training. So he's day-to-day. Um, I take that to me. He's probably not going to play Saturday. We'll see. Um, in the back of Gio's mind, he has to know that he has two World Cup qualifiers with Mexico coming up. Uh, and I'm not sure how, how that affects that. I'm not sure whether Osorio will take him if he doesn't play, thinking that he's rested, or will say if he's not good enough to play for his club team, he can't play for us. So... I think that's probably going to impact Gio's thinking a little bit. I know that he wants to play in those World Cup qualifiers. So we'll see. The other uh, injury problem that we have now that's uh, just popped up is Yao Pedro apparently has a, a, a knee issue. Um, the Galaxy did not address the injury uh, straight on. They said he will be available Saturday. Uh, that didn't answer my question. I wanted to know if he had a knee problem. They said he will be available Saturday. They didn't say he would start Saturday. 
they said that he will be available. So we'll see what, where that goes. And, of course, as you know, Robbie Rogers, in my mind, is months away. Uh, and uh, Jesse's artist and Ashley Cole apparently making progress, um, uh, along with Bradford Jamison, by the way, who missed last game, too. He's been dealing with a knock. Those guys are making progress. I personally, uh, given the way that Kurt Unhoffel doesn't seem to be pushing the panic button yet, I would be a little bit surprised to see those guys play uh, in Salt Lake City just because um, they'd be going to altitude and, and they're obviously not uh, 100% fit. And also sort of a, a general rule with you know, guys with injuries is if they're ready to play on, uh, on Tuesday, give them to next Tuesday, um, just give them that extra week uh, you know, in baseball, give them that extra game. So I would expect Kurt to be a little bit more um, cautious given that we're only in the third game of the season. So there's where we are with injuries. A lot of news. Um, it could be another very, very young team in Real Salt Lake. Yeah, and if you look at that, so with Giovanni Dos, Al- Dos Santos possibly out, you look at Jack McBean is definitely going to start. Uh, you know, maybe they put somebody with like Jose Villarreal with him. You saw how good Jose Villarreal was. Those two played off of each other in LA Galaxy too. Or you could put in Ari Lasseter, who also has a link-up time with Jack McBean. So you can put those guys in. I think that if you're pulling the panic button right now on Jack McBean, then you completely completely discount the fact that um, he's been left on an island even with the 10 guys. Now, again, like I said, he has to do better with some of the half chances. He has to create some more. I think he has that pressure. It's not going to be forever. I mean, you know, I don't think Cardinalfo sits with Jack McBean until the end of, you know, time. Realistically, I think that Jack McBean has to start producing some stuff, has to start doing some things, and we're going to see how that goes uh, very quickly. RSL is a game the LA Galaxy realistically have a shot, Kevin, at winning. It's an important game. They need to get in there. It's a young team at altitude against an older team in RSL who struggled a little bit. There's a chance for the LA Galaxy to take three points. Uh, against RSL. All right, let's go. Uh, let's go again. We talked about uh, uh, Lake Show Dre at Lake Show Dre says how uh, how about how below average Joao Pedro has been. We've talked a little bit about it, the injury problems, Kevin. But what have you seen from Joao Pedro to start the season? Well, yeah, the, you know we don't we don't know about the injury problems. So that you know, and he hasn't used that excuse. No. Uh, you know, you and I found that out not from the team or not from him. So no one's making an excuse of it, which. You know, it's a kind of a standard thing to do if, in fact, he's having a problem and it's affecting his play. But it, it, this is a difficult league. Um, you know, he's coming over from a totally different league where, you know, play is maybe a little bit more stylish. Here it's very physical, and, uh, and I think he probably, in the position that he plays, uh, has, has had some trouble adjusting to that. I think it's more the style of play uh, than the player. Now, you know, if we have this conversation and, and we reach the same verdict in a couple of months, then, right. then that's a bad deal. The Galaxy spent a lot of time looking at this guy, and he's a guy that they apparently really wanted. Um, so, you know, they were all in on him. They had no doubts when they got him. But you know, I saw him go to the turf quite a bit yesterday, um, you know, collisions and things, and, and it was clear to me. I, I watched him a little closer yesterday than I did in the first game, I have to say. Um, and without Jermaine Jones yesterday, by the way, and I think that might have had something to do with it. There wasn't anybody out there to, to uh, you know, trade body shots with the opponents. Right. And Jal Pedro wound up getting a lot of that. So I saw him go down a lot. I watched him a lot, and he was definitely struggling with the physicality of it. Now it's up to him to make that adjustment. And he's had two games now. Uh, he's played two really good teams. He now has a sense of what he's got going forward. Yeah, it's going to be uh, interesting to see how he adjusts. His adjustment is important. He's a guy they spent a lot of money on. He is a clear-cut starter. He will be the starter. So it's one of those things he has to, you know, hopefully if there is an injury again, sort of a rumor, um, but, you know, we're not telling you this because we, we think it's unfounded. Um, you know, it's it's one of these things that if you look at, uh, you know, his play and how he adapts to Major League Soccer, it's going to be very important that he adapts quickly, gets used to the physicality, and you saw some of the stuff that he's able to do, Kevin. There's skill checks out there. He He's dancing on the ball. He's a, he's a talented, creative player who's going to be sort of in that defensive midfielder position. If he can start being able to express himself and get free of some of these physical challenges that seem to have sort of uh, held him back or keep him from moving too far forward, I think he can be a good player. I think it's the same with Alison Drini, quite honestly. How quickly can Alison Drini adjust to the physical play of Major League Soccer, Kevin? We've seen Alison Drini get hammered, get hit. He's, he's, he's taken a couple dives. Uh, you know, he seems to think that he gets fouled all the time in a Major League Soccer. That's just, that's just not the case. Well, a couple of things on that. Alison Drini has definitely uh, perfected the Robbie King protest after every, uh, after every play. He's really good at the arm waving, everything, just like Robbie, and he's got Robbie's number. So and I suppose that's encouraging in its own way. But you know, going back to Pedro, uh, there are a couple of goals, and there was one goal definitely in the first game where 
Yao Pedro really needed to track back on a guy and let, let uh, the guy he was supposed to be helping Mark let him get away, and it led to a goal. And you wonder in the counterattack goal yesterday, that came right up the middle. Um, I know everybody was pushing forward, um, uh, but Chow Pedro is supposed to be, my understanding is, maybe yesterday was different, but he's supposed to be the holding midfielder. Jermaine Jones is supposed to be the guy pushing forward. Um, you, you know, if Chow Pedro is your holding midfielder, how does he get beat on a couple of goals? And, and then if you, he's your holding midfielder, um, he's got to uh, adapt to this physical play because that's what he's going to be called on to do. Yeah, it certainly is. I, I will also say that somebody uh, texted me and said that they thought Yellow Van Dom was uh, was a key person in Sunday's loss, and the fact that he didn't come back after he was forward on a corner kick, and then the counterattack goal from uh, the Portland Timbers that he wanted to stay forward, and that broke down, and that was one of the reasons they gave up the goal. And then, of course, they this particular person thought that that was a boneheaded move, and I, I tend to agree. You get a yellow card for descent, and then you go into a challenge like that. Whether or not you hit the person or not, you can't have your captain doing that three minutes separated, less than three minutes separated, get two yellow cards. I get that there was no contact. I get that there was dives, but he knew he had a yellow card when he went into that second challenge. And, you know, clearly in Major League Soccer, especially, yellows are going to be a big target. I'm telling you right now. He was a big target at the beginning of last year in terms of how aggressive he was. Remember, everybody's complaining that he was overly aggressive. The uh, the referees penalized him for it early. Uh, and I think you're seeing the same thing again, is that I think some referees in Major League Soccer think that Yellow Van Dam is too physical and they're going to take a, a poor view of that. So Yellow needs to be smarter on that as well. Um, let's see. Oh, I like this one from Sev. How much will Ikea spend to get a Galaxy sponsorship if Slaton signs? What do you think? A new new sponsorship? Now, you said that came from Sev. Is that from Sebastian Legette by any chance? No, no. It's, a, oh, it's with I, a V and not a B. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I was talking to my wife about that today. I made that, that comment. I wonder if uh, Ikea is coming over. And she said, are they a sponsor? And I said, no. Not yet. Uh, no, I I, uh, I don't think they're going to get involved uh, one way or the other. And and you know, I know that uh, question somewhat in jest, but uh, you know, we may in the next in future programs need to start taking this uh, thing with Eber a little bit uh, more seriously. Right now, I still kind of uh, the, the figure that's been thrown out there. We haven't verified it. It has no source to it. it could be coming from Eber's agent. It's supposedly, uh, eighteen million dollars was the offer that the Galaxy made. Uh, which would be competitive, I think, but the Galaxy has a long way to go before we can really start sizing uh, Ibra up for a Galaxy uniform. Yeah, besides, if you, if you get a Galaxy kit sponsored by IKEA, you have to put it together yourself, and it doesn't, come, right. it doesn't come with a lot well, of this screws. Team is, this team has kind of put it together yourself, <laughs> isn't it? It is. It's a perfect sponsorship. You can build and select your own LA Galaxy team, get it from IKEA. That's where you can find it. It'll be in bin 37-B all the way down at the far end. Just keep looking for it on the right. All right, we continue on. Uh, is attendance a major concern, and who else from who else besides Zlatan could the Galaxy realistically bring in to fill seats? I think this is an important question, Kevin. You saw the attendance on uh, on Sunday. This question comes from Paul. So at Royal Footballer, what do you think about the uh, the attendance? Uh, I, if I'm the Galaxy, I would be really troubled by it. Um, pretty good weather. I, well, good weather. Yeah, both it was, it was yeah, gorgeous. Weekend, weekend games, not really late, not really early. You know, so it's right in kind of that family uh, time. Um, it, it, you know, people talk about the pent up, uh, demand for MLS and I, and that's coming from the league. I'm not saying that it, that's out there, but that's the marketing, uh, thing, you know, oh, uh, fans can't wait for the league to get started. Nick Green in the, uh, LA daily news did a, an interesting column where he talked about, um, the fact that yes, Atlanta drew a record crowd and Orlando drew a record crowd, but across the league, a lot of teams were down in attendance for their openers. Uh, the galaxy, uh, you know, they had their, I think that was our lowest opener in three or four years as far as attendance goes. Yesterday's attendance was the lowest uh, for a home game since last June. Uh, you know, attendance typically dives at the start of the summer, so that's why uh, yesterday's attendance is a little bit concerning. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you do have to worry about it because this is a new team and, and there's been some, uh, um, uh, some uh, what's the word, anticipation built up to come out and see these new guys, but there isn't a Robbie Keane, there isn't a Steven Gerrard, and, you can, you can look at that two ways. Uh, MLS says come out and watch the soccer. Don't watch the aging stars that you saw playing in the Premier League. And, and I think that's a pretty good marketing tool as it goes. But maybe we're not there yet in L.A. and maybe even around the league. Maybe people need to come out. They want to come out and see us, especially in a town like L.A. 
they want to come out and they want to see a celebrity. Yes. And there isn't a celebrity right now. And uh, I think we can all agree that Steven Gerrard was not worth $6 million. And for most of the year, Robbie Keane probably wasn't worth the $4 million he was getting. But I will tell you, when I went on the road with the Galaxy, every stadium we went to, uh, there were tons of people wearing Steven Gerrard jerseys and, and some with Robbie Keane jerseys. and certainly a ton of people wearing Gio Dos Santos jerseys. So, um, Major League Soccer, I think they're correct. Let's come out and watch the soccer. Let's cheer for good soccer. Let's not cheer for the name on the back of the shirt. But um, that's uh, unfortunately, at that point, that's still drawn a lot of the fans out there. And without a Gerard or a Keane, it's hard to get people to show up to see Yao Pedro and, uh, and Ramon Allison Greeny right now. Maybe they'll turn out to be the greatest players in league history. Uh, it's too early to judge. But right now, they're not putting a lot of butts in seats. Yeah, and I, I will just I will sort of add on to that and say that you know a lot of people argued with me whenever I said that in LA you need stars and you need trophies you need both of those the LA Galaxy currently producing neither of those you're gonna see attendance suffer uh, yes you still need a star you need somebody like Ibrahimovic are there other players who can do that in terms of just filling up I mean if Ibra comes Kevin the LA Galaxy sell out every game from there on through the rest of the year. I, I think that that's a, I, I feel like that would be an easy thing to say because I remember when David Beckham came and this is in the same planetary zone as, as Ibrahimovic and David Beckham. I think that they're, they're, they're close. So when you look at that thing, when you look at what he could do, he could raise the attendance, but otherwise you have to talk about really big names that are going to fill a stadium regardless of what the LA Galaxy do. David Beckham did it for the most part. Yeah, go ahead, Kev. Well, I wanted to jump in on that because you make a lot of really good points, and I'm going to keep calling him Ibra because I keep getting people telling me I'm not pronouncing his name correctly, so... That's why I work in print journalism and not uh, radio or TV. So I'm going to call him Ibra. It's the Swedish guy we're talking about. That's right. But uh, the, the Galaxy are smart enough to see that. They've seen two games now, um, first two games of the season against good opponents at home. Gela Van Dam is, uh, you know, if you haven't been out to a Galaxy game, suspensions aside, Gela Van Dam is a really, really interesting player to watch. He's by far the best player on the team. He was last year. He, I think he was in the, in the short time he's played this year. The Galaxy are, 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 are thinking, hey, you're going to come out and see Yellow Van Damme. He's We're going to you know, sign him with cam money. He, you know, we're going uh, to be uh, you know, fiscally prudent, and we're going to get good players. Again, you know, m- maybe uh, crowds aren't there yet. But, sh- yeah, if, if Ibra comes, and that's a huge if, yeah, he sells out, and he turns this whole thing around. And, and MLS is going to get very interested in making that happen. You know, all, it, it's still the single-entity structure. Yes, Ibra will play for the Galaxy, but the money will largely come from the league. So the league is going to get very interested in this because the Galaxy is the marquee franchise, and the marquee franchise needs to have a marquee player. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's very important. But then going back to just briefly to the attendance and, and attendance problems now and the team right now, not looking ahead to the Swedish guy coming. Um, you know, last year we had Bruce Arena, the greatest coach in, in the history of U.S. soccer. Now we have Kurt Anoffel, um, and, and that is not, uh, by any means, criticism of Kurt. It's just, you know, the Yankees went from Joe Torrey to Joe Girardi, and it took Joe Girardi a little, way, a little while to find his feet. So, um, you know, you've got from the greatest coach in soccer history to Kurt Anoppo, a guy who comes over from uh, a USL team. You, you lose Robbie Keane, one of the top ten scorers in the history of the Premier League, and Steven Girard, captain of, the, of Liverpool and the English national team. Granted, not contributors, but they were on the field, they were on the team. So it's going to take a little bit of adjustment. We may not be having this conversation. We may be looking back at this podcast and laughing uh, in July when they've sold out five or six games in a row if the team turns it around. Yes. But, you know, if you're taking a snapshot in time right now, um, I think the team need, really needs to be concerned, and I think that it's going to put a little more uh, emphasis on this attempt to sign uh, uh, Ibra. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting. The LA Galaxy will face off against Real Salt Lake on Saturday, March 18th. This is a 6.30 Pacific time kickoff, 6.30 p.m. Pacific time kickoff. That game will be on Spectrum Sportsnet and Spectrum Deportes. Again, LA Galaxy traveling to Real Salt Lake, possibly without Giovanni Dos Santos, uh, possibly without Yella Van Damme, possibly without Ashley Cole or Giassi Zardes or Robbie Rogers, um, and hopefully with Joao Pedro, who will be available for that game. So all of these things sort of coming in. But like I said, you look at their schedule, Kevin, uh, Saturday seems like one of the best chances the LA Galaxy have to pick up with their first win of the season. And granted, it's on the road. But I just have to feel that the momentum, and I do feel like there's momentum being built by the younger core of this team, but I feel like the momentum 
His swinging a little bit in the Galaxy's favor. Hopefully those suspensions go away. You get back Jermaine Jones. You get back Dave Romney. Uh, maybe Nathan Smith and Bradley Diallo have played their way onto the field as well. I mean, there's there's some good things to take from the young kids, but they need to start scoring goals, and I think that's what we need to see on you know, Saturday. You, you know what? This is uh, As you're going through that, first of all, my first thought was as you're naming all the people that won't go, I'm thinking that you know, the, the team could fly there on a Cessna, uh, <laughs> Piper Cub, you know, filling a lot of space. But the other thing is, you're, as you're talking about all these young guys, you know, I would guess that if I'm an opponent, uh, especially an opposing coach, the Galaxy would be the last team I would want to play. And the reason is because there's a lot of young guys that we don't have a history with. They're unpredictable. Uh, we don't know what they're going to do. They don't know what they're going to do sometimes. And, um, and, and they're all hungry, and they're all playing uh, you know, more for anything, I think, probably just from the joy and, and the excitement of being in MLS right now. Uh, I think that's where a lot of this hustle and, and, and this attitude comes from. I mean, yes, they're 0-2, but I think, as we both said, they were really fun to watch because they just simply do not quit. So if, if I'm the Real Salt Lake coach or Vancouver after that um, and the players, this is a really dangerous team, and they know they're playing with house money. They have nothing to lose at this point. Um, so, uh, you know, that the, the – they're going to surprise somebody re- in a real big way here in the next couple of weeks. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think quite honestly, I think there's, there's a lot of talent with this team. As they get healthier, they're going to get better. The, the chemistry will gel. So, I, I, you know, I'm optimistic going forward. But you look at what they've done so far against two good teams. They were competitive in both of those games. I'm certainly not going to tell you they weren't. Uh, but, you know, going against Real Salt Lake, this is a chance. Again, uh, we're going to have a live show coming up on Thursday at 7 p.m., so make sure you join us for that as we go ahead and preview this game. But, Kevin, I, I know it's getting closer to, uh, to dropping the puck there, so I want to let you go. Any uh, final things you want to talk about? No, I think, uh, I think we covered it a lot. It's, it's really difficult for, um, you know, people trying to take a, an independent view, not, not be a fan. I know a lot of the listeners are fans, but when you try to judge the team fairly, there's a lot of things that you see good and a lot of things that you see bad, and, it's, and, and there are a lot of things that actually I want to say about the team, but it's, it's simply too early in the season to see it. We, we've, you remember Kurt Anoffo and, and a lot of these players are just getting started in this. Um, the things that make them hard to prepare for as an opposing coach makes them hard to judge. You know, as a journalist, look down and say, this guy's not playing the way he used to play. Well, I've never seen him play before, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, I think if you're a fan, I think there's a lot to look forward to. I don't think an MLS Cup is something you're looking forward to this year. But, um, you know, it, it, it's going to be an exciting team to watch. And the one thing about it is you're not going to see anybody walking down the field. These guys are going to hustle all the time. They're going to be exciting. Whether that's an exciting loss or an exciting win or an exciting draw, they're going to be excited. All right. You can catch Kevin at kbaxter11 on Twitter. Please go follow him there. And, of course, you can find all of his writing at LA Times. Dot com uh, where he writes about the LA Galaxy, the LA Kings, and soccer in general. So please uh, go follow him there. Kevin, thanks for uh, stopping by before you got to the Kings game, all right? Thank you very much. Uh, for all right, there we go. Kevin Baxter, our uh, co-host here on Corner of the Galaxy from the Box, getting ready to cover the LA Kings. Glad we could catch him before that happens. All right, that does it for our show. Go follow me on Twitter at Jay Guessman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N, and of course at Galaxy Podcast. On Twitter, go to cornerofthegalaxy.com where you can find all of our written articles. I have a game recap up there. You can read all of the things that I sort of picked out in this particular game. Uh, and again, the LA Galaxy getting ready to face off against Real Salt Lake on Saturday, Saturday, March 18th. All right, that does it for me. For Mr. Kevin Baxter, I'm Josh Guessman, and you've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. We will catch you next week. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy from the Box podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. And for all of your independent LA Galaxy news, discussion, and entertainment, including this podcast, head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Fans, thanks for listening. We ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everyone.